Hi again, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com. We finished our study through Titus. And as, uh, you know, by request, I, I agreed to make a video on how to study. Now, I would prefer to call this how I study. Uh, it may not be the way others study. And the, I think the greatest emphasis, you know, that I could place on this whole subject is, is just what Paul wrote to Timothy. And we'll, we're going to look at that. Nothing dare replace it. And yet, I have to say here right at the outset that it, it is at least my belief that that's the last thing Christians want to do. the the very last thing and especially uh, when you when you look at it from a, a scholarly uh, sort of perspective and I understand that we're not all Bible scholars but it's it's strange to me how that or it shouldn't be strange uh, I guess but it, it's a little odd how that scripture doesn't even mention that it 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 tends to present the whole subject of studying to show yourself approved from an individual standpoint and that pertaining to every believer no matter their age, their background, their educational status or anything else. And why is that? It's because uh, truth can come out of the mouths of babes. This is a, I find this a great challenge. Uh, to just even just to present my way of studying I don't want to bore people I don't want them to think that I mean the last thing that, that, that I think that people want to do nowadays is go back to school but I think that if you hang with me on this uh, you might find something at least in my prayer is that you'll find something uh, in this presentation helpful so knowing that it's in 2 Timothy chapter 2 that we read, Study to show thyself, uh, thyself approved, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Uh, let's back up just a little bit. Let's get a little background on the, the context here before I go through and, and show you just all the, the many uh, points that, that I, I tend to look at or the the thoughts or the considerations that I try to, to hold in mind as I go through the text in studying to present a video or just studying for my own personal benefit. We don't, we don't know a whole lot about Timothy. What we do know that he was, he was born in around 17 AD, uh, thereabouts, uh, give or take a few years. Uh, when Jesus was probably in his 20s. And so he was a teen when Jesus was crucified. Uh, Timothy became Paul's disciple, and uh, later on he became his constant companion and co-worker in preaching the gospel. And if you've followed this ministry any length of time, you know where I stand pertaining as it pertains to the gospel. I believe it was in the year 52 that uh, A.D. that Paul and Silas took Timothy along with them on their journey to Macedonia. Uh, uh, Augustine, uh, you, if you read Augustine, he'll talk about how that uh, how much zeal uh, that Timothy had. I think Paul also recognized just how zealous Timothy was. You know, he left his country, he left his house, he left his parents to follow Paul uh, in order to share in his poverty. And I, I think this is, that's interesting because I'm going to come back to that point because you're going to see in, in 2 Timothy 2 uh, that sharing in uh, our suffering, uh, sharing together with as it pertains to the gospel and sharing in the suffering with another, in uh, 
Timothy, he might have been, uh, some, many say that he was, he was subject to ill health, that he, uh, he had uh, frequent ailments, uh, which is why Paul encouraged him to use a little bit of wine uh, for his stomach's sake. Now, when Paul went on to Athens, Silas and Timothy, they stayed on, they stayed, or they stayed for some time uh, at uh, uh, Thessalonica, I believe, before joining Paul at Corinth. And then Timothy, he next he appears during Paul's stay in Ephesus, and in late 56 or early 57 A.D., Paul sent him forth to Macedonia with the, with the aim that he would eventually arrive at Corinth. And Timothy arrived at Corinth just after Paul's letter, 1 Corinthians, uh, reached that city. So Timothy was with Paul in Corinth during the winter of, of 57, uh, 58, when Paul uh, sent his letter to the Romans. We know that from the 16th chapter of Romans. And according to Acts 20, he was with Paul in Macedonia just before Passover in 58. He left the city uh, before Paul, going ahead of him. To, to await Paul in Troas. And that's the last mention of Timothy in Acts. In the year 64, Paul left Timothy at Ephesus to govern that church. So we do know a whole lot about uh, what Timothy did. And we know just pretty much how Timothy was as far as him being zealous and that in relationship to the gospel. Now, his relationship with Paul was very close, and Paul entrusted him with missions of great importance. His name actually appears as the co-author. Many, many don't realize this. Uh, the co-author on 2 Corinthians, Philippians, Colossians, 1 Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians, and Philemon. Paul wrote to the Philippians about Timothy, saying that I have no one like him. And when Paul was in prison and he was awaiting martyrdom, he summoned his faithful friend Timothy for a last and final farewell. That Timothy was jailed at least once during the period of, of the writing of the New Testament is implied by the writer of Hebrews mentioning Timothy's release at the end of that epistle. Now, although his death is not recorded in the Bible, uh, it's not stated in the Bible, other uh, outside sources, have they have records of his death, the, uh, which states that in the year 97 A.D., the 80-year-old uh, Timothy tried to, he tried to, to halt a procession in honor of the goddess Diana by preaching the gospel, and the angry mob, uh, the pagans, mob, they beat him, they dragged him through the streets, and they stoned him to death. Let's look at 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 3 and 4. I'm, I've backed up quite a bit, almost to the beginning of chapter 2. Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. The word endure hardness there in the, in the Greek, the word means to share in suffering with. And which I would, I would suggest that we know nothing of unless we are proclaiming the truth of the gospel. If we're not pro proclaiming the truth of the gospel, we do not know how to, or we have no experience of enduring hardness uh, in the sense that Paul is, is talking about this here in this, in this chapter. 
the all familiar verse, uh, verse 15, study to show thyself approved, uh, thyself approved unto God, a, a workman that needeth not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth, is, uh, I think just about every Christian can probably quote that verse word by word. Yet I, I will submit again that most Christians, even though they are so familiar with that famous verse, are, are very reluctant, very reluctant. Uh, they don't find it all that easy to actually bear down and study God's Word. You know, and I, I, I put that in comparison to, I place that in comparison to just a superficial reading of the word many Christians that's all they do is they read the Word of God they read this book they read it like a novel or they read it like a newspaper and they call that studying and folks that is not studying God's Word study is study read is read and in fact uh, we're not commanded to read you will find the commandment to read not ne do not neglect the reading of the scriptures and that's in a body context but as far as an individual context is is concerned we are commanded to study and folks study is hard work and at the risk once again at the risk of alienating uh what's left of my of my viewers here because it's i think that's the last thing that we want to do is go back to school here I'm going to try to make this as simple as possible. Uh, I believe that we can get as, as, as extensive as we can get quite extensive when it comes to, you know, all of the many aspects that are involved in an in-depth study of God's word. And folks, I, I don't want to go. I don't want to go college on people. I don't want to go seminary on everybody. I don't want to use hard to throw out words and phrases that are that are, that are difficult or uncommon uh, that are uh, uh, undefined that, that just cause people to lose interest right here at the outset of here of this I struggled with this last night sitting around I, I, I really did struggle with how to present this in a way that would be interesting you know without uh, Without the uh, little cocoa, I don't, many of you remember cocoa, the little bird that sat on my shoulder during one video, or to be out here with jelly bean or something just to make this interesting, this video interesting and less textbook. And, and folks, I, I don't know how to do that. I really don't. This is such a serious matter. You know, we don't want to handle his word deceitfully. This is God's word. And it's a love letter written to us, and it has great benefit in our lives if we, if we determine to bear down and study God's Word in a way in which we don't wind up, we're, the, we're consistent in our theology. We're, we don't wind up contradicting ourselves. We don't wind up speaking speaking against the truth, lying against the truth, and understand that we're not all gifted teachers or preachers, or, but we are individual members of the body of Christ, and we only have one message, and that message is Jesus Christ. He, that He's our life. He's our message. He's our ministry. He's our focus. He's our emphasis. It is all about Jesus Christ. It is not about ourselves. It's not about what I think that you ought to do to become a better Christian. It's not what you did to become a, about what you did to become a Christian. It's all about what Christ did. It's about what He did, not what we did. Our message, our ministry, our life, our focus, folks, ought to always be on Jesus Christ and in, in a a serious approach to, to study, the study of God's Word, will reveal that truth, will we'll prove to you, will prove to any Christian 
that He is our message, our ministry, our life, our hope. That we don't have confidence in ourselves. That we don't live according to the law. We don't walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Now, I'm going to anticipate that there may be some objections from some people right here, right away, that say, well, Steve, I don't really have to study. I don't have to do that. Uh, you know, I depend on my pastor, you know, to tell me the truth. Uh, I go to church. I sit there. I listen intently Sunday after Sunday. I trust the man. I don't think he's going to lie to me. I don't really have to, to study. I'm not a preacher. I'm not a minister. I'm not gifted as a teacher. So I don't really have to study. Or, or, you, or I, might, I can imagine some, hearing someone say, well, the Lord just speaks to me apart from His Word. And folks, I can tell you for a fact that that is not the truth. Hebrews 1.1, 1, 1, it's, a, 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 it's not a verse that's hard to... It's, it's a verse that's easy to remember. Hebrews 1.1 1, 1, will tell you folks that God does not speak to anyone today apart from His Word. Another thing that I want to, to mention here is that it is a highly intellectual endeavor, uh, just like uh, anything else, any other discipline, becoming a doctor, becoming a veterinarian. Become, it's, it's, don't think that, that we're going to to grow in grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ through emotions, feelings, uh, what we think, uh, you know, how we feel. So don't, don't tell me that you don't have to study. And, and I don't want you to tell me that you don't have time to study. That's also a, uh, I think that's a little bit of a cop out. Well, I just don't have time to study, Steve. I'm so busy. Really? Uh, you would have you would be hard pressed to convince me of that. I believe God has made made it that time available to every single one of His children to study. The word "study" there in Second Timothy two fifteen is the word is spadazo. It's it means to make haste. Actually, it's the word you know, and, and this may come as a surprise to you. Study to show thyself approved, and the word "study" isn't there. It is spudazo. It means, the word means to make haste, diligence. I hasten, I'm eager, I'm zealous. That's what the word means. And I just got through mentioning how zealous the record showed Timothy to be. Properly, the word means to, to be swift, to go fast, to be speedy. Okay, that's what the word means. You know, hurry up. You know, go about it in a speedy, fast, swift way, zealous way. Figuratively, uh, to move speedily by showing full diligence. In other words, just fully applying yourself, fully applying oneself. And, and folks, I'm a firm believer that we get out of something just what we put into it. If you don't, if you don't put a lot of work into it, you're not going to get a lot out of it. On the other hand, if you do, you are. The word accurately handling, you know, there in that verse, it's actually from a compound word. It, most people understand it is to be, to cut it straight, to cut straight properly on a straight line. I was cutting a piece of plywood the other day with my skill saw. My skill saw has a little laser guide on it. And I was trying to stay, you know, on the line with that laser. I was cutting it straight. And that's basically what the word rightly divide means. The word to present. Well, it's para from alongside, para, uh, close beside. If I'm standing next to you, close to you, beside you, that's para. And the word histamine, which is to stand. If I, if I stood up and I just stood here looking at, just, you know, stood here looking at you, that's histamine. Uh, Parahistamine, 
is to stand close beside. That's what the word means. Stand close beside God. Okay? That's important to take note of. And the word approved, dokamos. It was actually that word dokamos, approved, a workman that, that needeth, you know, that's approved to God. It was, it was used, that word was used for the proving or the testing of coins to make sure that they were genuine, not counterfeit, not corrupted. So just kind of think, uh, you know, detector pen. You know, how they, you know, you go into a store, you might, you have a $20 bill, you hand it to the clerk, uh, or a $100 bill, and she's going to, you know, use that detector pen to, to make sure that you're not giving her a, a counterfeit $100 bill. That's the word approved. That's what the word, that's the definition of the word. So, I'll, I'll quickly go over some of the things that I think that are important, uh, in fact, vital. Some things are extremely vital when it comes to uh, studying His Word. If we want to take and, and get the most out of it, like squeezing all the, all the juice out of it. Okay, so I'm getting ready to do a video, and uh, I'm in uh, Romans uh, chapter 5. And I'm going through there verse by verse, and I've looked at a section of, of that text that I want to do a video on. And, uh, of course, a lot of it is built upon, you know, what has preceded it, what's gone before it. Uh, the first thing that I think that, that enters my mind is, is that Scripture interprets Scripture. I don't have to look outside of Scripture for an interpretation of any particular verse. That's an important fact to keep in mind. And any part, any part of Scripture has to be understood in light of its whole. Now, that, that seems to make, make common sense. It's that, and that's not rocket science. It's just really more like common sense. If uh, a, a man wrote his wife, if a husband wrote his wife a love letter, and you just took out a little snippet of that love letter, you know, that it has to be interpreted in, in light of the whole letter. Another aspect that is important, you, and many of you have heard me mention this numerous times in, in my videos, I'll always uh, at least try to make some effort to, to, to make note of the fact that God is the author, not man. God wrote this book. We're not looking at man's logic, man's opinion, man's uh, speculation, uh, his reasoning. Uh, even though that his, uh, it's, it's it is. And we want to we want to be clear here that you know that it's it's it is important, I believe, to understand the life of Paul, the life of the human author, uh, maybe even perhaps some of the experiences that that he was that he went through the kind of person that he was, his demeanor, his character, and all that. But my point is, is that God is the author, not man. And so I would begin with a particular, pat. once I've established how many verses I want to actually deal with, I want to read that, and I want to read that more than once. Uh, not just think, okay, well, I've read that, that's it. I don't need to read it. I don't need to read it again. Read it three times. Read it five times. Read it ten times. Depends on how much how much text that you've you know you've set aside for yourself. But it, just a simple reading of the particular passage that is number one. That's that's what I would do first. And as I said again, this is what I do. This is not what. There's nothing set in stone here. Okay. There's no there are no rules here as far as how you should study. You may want to study in a different way than I do, but this is what I would do. I would read through it several times to make sure I really just got the gist of it. And then the next thing that I would do, folks, is I would note overall context. This is supremely important. It's, it's what get, gets Christians in trouble all the time. If you don't note the, the context, then you're not doing yourself a very big favor. You want to note the overall context, but you also want to take note of the immediate context. 
And by that, I mean, you know, just what I mean. There is an immediate context, and then there is an overall context. You also want to ask yourself, is it speaking to the body of Christ? Is it in a body context or an individual context? And that will get Christians in trouble all the time because many Christians will take something that's in a body context and they'll interpret it and they'll apply it in the sense of an individual context. Something else you want to take note of is, is it literal or is it a parable? Is it allegory? Is it, uh, uh, there's even what they call, uh, li there's literal and there's figurative. There's even what they call literal, figurative literal, literal or literal figurative. And we're not going to get into stuff like that. It's just that you want to, you want to make sure that if, uh, you're looking at something. Is this a real account? Is this a literal, did this really happen? Or is this a parable, a simple story used to illustrate a moral or a spiritual lesson? You want to take note of that fact as you're going through the text, especially if you're in the Gospels. You don't see, uh, you don't see much as far as parable is concerned in, in Paul's epistles. But you certainly do in the teachings of our Lord in his ministry regarding the kingdom in the Gospels. Another thing you want to ask yourself is who is the intended audience? Who is being addressed? Is it an individual like Paul is writing to Timothy? Is, it, is, is he writing to the church? Is it, is, who is the Holy Spirit conveying his thoughts to here? Who is the intended audience? Who is it exactly that's being addressed? And that, again, is supremely important when it comes to understanding what took place before Calvary and what took place after Calvary. The uh, gospel of the kingdom as compared to the gospel of Christ. You know, there's a dispensational distinction to take hold of there. You need to make that dispensational distinction. Was it written or spoken before or after the cross? That, that's, that makes a huge difference. Many of the teachings that we read in the gospels were, was Jesus speaking to his people, the Israel, concerning the kingdom that he was offering at the time, which was rejected, which in many cases, much of that teaching actually contradicts much of what Paul teaches, and yet we know that there's no contradiction in any of the Word of God. Therefore, the the only explanation is, is that we're looking at a different dispensation, a different way of God's, God dealing with His people during any particular time uh, or age in, 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 uh, in human history. You want to ask yourself, why was it written? What was the author's concern? And again, we're looking at God, the Holy Spirit, as being the divine author. We also want to note the human author, but why was it written? What, what is on the heart of God? When you're looking at a passage, any particular passage, and you know that this is divinely inspired scripture, this is God-breathed, that God wrote this, you can oftentimes get a sense of God's heart in a matter, and sometimes in a very strong way. Uh, I also want you to take note of the fact that God has, especially at this particular time, this, this junction in human history, He's made available an enormous amount of helps, of study tools. You know, Strong's, Vines, Interlinears, you have mobile apps, uh, 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 desktop apps, you have you know, Bible Hub, you have all kinds of, of Bible study aids nowadays and you can study at the speed of light it's a lot different than our ancestors folks i mean to not study nowadays when god has made so much of that available is really well you just don't have any excuse we don't have any excuse for not studying nowadays god has made so much available to do that that we just uh 
It's, it's sad to see Christians not taking advantage of that. So now we come down to our actual, actually studying the text, and we're looking at, what are we looking at? We're looking at words. It all comes down to words, folks. This is God's word. So we're looking at, at words. So we've got to define terms. Okay, word meanings are important. This is extremely crucial. Okay, if, if, a, if God gives you a single word and it means something uh, different to you than it meant to him, then folks, you are in trouble. Okay, because you are interpreting a word spoken by the almighty, majestic God, creator of heaven and earth, and you're making that word say something other than what he meant when he said it. And there's only one interpretation, and, and that is what the author had in mind when he spoke it. I don't care if it's a divine or human author. If I wrote you a letter, there's only one intention. There's, when I, when I wrote, wrote these words to you, there's, there's only one thought I had in mind, and that was, you know. So, I can't emphasize just how important that is. Word meanings. We've got to define terms, folks. We have to, to define terms. Sometimes a single word we, we might just lump a whole bunch of other words in together with one word and say, well, that, that, that's what that means, when in fact it doesn't. I want you to, to, I want, I want you to, I want to impress upon you folks that, and this is just common sense, folks, if, if God uses five different, different individual words, then these five different individual words have five different individual meanings, okay? And you can't make all five mean the same thing. That's just common sense. They're not synonymous with one another. Uh, you could note derivatives. Uh, uh, that, that is a word that's derived from another word or from a root in the same uh, language or another language. That's something else that you can do. What I love to do is I, I love to note the number of times that a word is used in, 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 a, in the particular testament that I'm looking at. If I'm looking at the New Testament, how many times is that word used in the New Testament? Or how many times is that word used? How many times does that same word appear in the, in, in the Old Testament? a uh, derivative of that word, okay? Uh, same word that's used in the, in the Hebrew, that's used in the Greek. So, sometimes, in many times you'll find out that this, this word's only been used once in all the New Testament. And I, I love it when I come across that. I find that exciting. God only chose to use that one word one time. Now, and how do, you, how do you do that? Well, there are tools for that, folks. Uh, most of the times, just uh, Strong's or Vine's Expository Dictionary of New Testament Words or some of your Bible apps will be able to show you that. If, uh, usually Strong's will be able to, to indicate the number of times that a word is used uh, in a particular uh, testament. Now, I know this seems like a lot of work, but you want to compare common translations. And with... with the number of translations there are today, there are more translations than you have time to compare, okay? But the major translations, uh, major, uh, New American Standard, uh, New International Version, just different uh, common translations, compare these translations with the authorized version, the King James Version, but understand that the King James Version, folks, is just another translation. I know there's a lot of people out there that are just King James only. And uh, I could never understand that. King James is just another translation, just like any other. I believe it's, it's for the most part, it's highly accurate. I actually believe the New American Standard is more accurate. I actually believe Young's literal translation is even more accurate 
the New American Standard. It's probably the closest to the original text. But folks, nothing will come as close to, to understanding what God said than the original text. And no, you don't have to be fluent in Greek or Hebrew to study in the original texts. You don't have to be scholars. You don't have to have a PhD. You don't have to have been to Bible college or seminary. There are many Christians, folks, just common, everyday, ordinary Christians who have a working knowledge of the original texts and they couldn't speak to you in Hebrew or Greek to save their lives. They just come, they've, and I've often told people the difference between, uh, you know, just even reading, uh, never mind studying, you know, a translation or say the King James, the difference in that and the original text is it's like the difference between watching a black and white TV and watching a color TV. I mean, which would you rather do? You know, SD, watch it in SD or watch it in, in, in HD. Watch it in black and white or watch it in color. Uh, I believe God has made it all, he's designed it so in such a way that even even a babe can understand. And it doesn't matter what translation he's using. The Holy Spirit is our teacher. He can reveal that truth. But he's not going to do that unless you apply yourself. He's not going to do... God is not going... He would not have put this verse here. Study to show yourselves approved. A workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. He's wasting his... He would have wasted his time writing that verse if it didn't matter. If you could just sit back and do nothing and, well, the Holy Spirit's my teacher. I don't have to do a thing. He's just going to drop this stuff, you know, on top of me. And, folks, that's not the way that works. We get out of it what we put into it. And so we can come full circle. We, we can come to the point of to where we're now looking at the grammatical structure. And I understand that that's extensive, folks. And, you know, and I'll admit, when I was in school, in high school, I used to, to hate grammar. And, and you may not believe this, but I, I got out of high school, and I wasn't really fully 100% sure as to what the difference was between a verb and a noun. That's right. I just didn't care. You know, I had other things on my mind. Girls, you know, uh horses, you know, anything but that. And I, I just thought all that was, in, 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 and that included math. I mean, I, I, couldn't, I couldn't hardly stand arithmetic, math, in any, any type, any forms of mathematics. But the grammatical structure, you know, the English and, and parsing, you know, and uh, diagramming and, you know, just looking at the basic grammatical structure of, of a sentence, and folks, we need to do that. And all I, all I can tell you with that is just try to find out everything that you can, everything that you can find out. But you need to take note of, of the grammar. Not just word meanings, but the grammar. And uh, the tenses, the, you know, the moods. Is it, is it a command? Is it in the imperative mood, the indicative mood, the, the mood of, of certainty or the subjunctive mood, the mood of uncertainty. And some of these study tools will help you see that. And it'll become commonplace. It'll become, after a while, it'll become natural. You just can't do anything but see that. And it adds spice and flavor to your study. It, it, it brings you to a point to where that all of this, folks, what it does, all of this, what it does is it opens up the picture of the text, of what you're seeing there. It, it paints a, a more clear picture of one thing, and that is what it was the thought that the Holy Spirit was trying to convey through this particular passage. And then you want to cross-reference. Most of your Bible apps will show you that. It, You'll, you'll be looking at a verse and, and you'll, it'll, it'll throw up cross-references, verses that are similar in identity. 
You also want to read the commentators. Get other people's opinion. Uh, particularly, you know, in particular, you want to see if there's a, been a consensus here among scholars. These are people that you need to respect because they've gone before you. Uh, God has plainly uh, preserved these works and that for our benefit. And then there's always a supposed application. We come down to actually uh, how, how this applies in our lives. So I, my suggestion, folks, is you, you, you do this and you become accustomed to it. It becomes natural over a period of time. You're, you're educating yourself. It's a highly intellectual endeavor. Uh, you're not flying by the seat of your pants. You're not, you're not living uh, by, uh, according to feelings and emotions, but it's all more based on facts and truth. You keep on pushing it. You keep on pushing it. Uh, because you, you're zealous, you really love His truth, you really love His Word, and you really love Him. You keep on pushing it. It's it's kind of like the, you know, the saying, uh, you know, you remember it used to back, you know, and uh, when we were younger, you know, we'd hear, you know, uh, well, you uh, party till you puke. Well, it's kind of in this now. It's study till you drop. That's that's basically what it amounts to and the dividends folks will be well worth it look i love you all i truly do i hope in some way this has helped someone until next time this is steve thanks for watching